Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait a few minutes to let folks join. Um, if you want to say hi in the, the chat, that's great. Um, but just give us a minute and let folks join on. Hey, good morning and good afternoon all. It's good to see everyone in the chat from, from various places across the country. So welcome everybody. We're gonna give it just a few more minutes, um, a few more seconds and then we'll get started. Now you could uh, push it back one slide actually. I was gonna spend a few minutes on that slide. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sarah Gallagher uh, of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and it's great to have you all here today. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on our recent re released report, Beyond Housing Stability, Understanding Tenant and Landlord's Experiences and the Impact of Emergency Rental Assistance. Um, released on October 30th, this report and study is a joint effort between the National Low Income Housing Coalition, the Housing Initiative at Penn and Reinvestment Fund. Um, and as you may know, the National Low Income Housing Coalition is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to achieving racially and socially equitable public policy that ensures people with the lowest incomes have quality homes that are accessible and affordable in communities of their choice. Housing Initiative at Penn is a small research center based out of Penn Praxis at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, HIP conducts uh, policy-based housing research and frequently works closely with states and cities to evaluate and meaningfully improve housing policies and programs. And Reinvestment Fund is a national community development financial institution based in Philadelphia. And the Policy Solutions Division conducts rigorous quantitative, qualitative, and geospatial research to inform public policy and community investment. Um, so we're very excited about this collaborative effort and this report. Um, today, we're going to share with you some of the findings included in the report and also provide an opportunity to dive deeper with the primary researchers who worked on the study and ask them some questions about the research itself. You can access the full report online um, and on our website. And before we get started, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, the program administrators, tenants, and landlords who participated in this study by providing their insights into their experiences with the ERA program. Um, we want to thank them for their time with uh, talking to us and working with us on interviews and focus groups and also reviewing sections of the report before publication. It really, this is really a truly collaborative effort. So we want to thank you for that. Uh, next slide. So we have a robust agenda for us this, this, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, and a wonderful panel of experts before us today. We have um, Andrew Arnon, who is a Senior Vice President for Research at NLIC, and Andrew is going to provide us with an overview of the program administrator's experience in setting up and implementing ERA, which was gathered from interviews with key staff at ERA programs that participated. Rebecca Ye, the Director of Housing Initiative at Penn and Cypress Mars, a Senior Research Analyst, are going to discuss the survey findings and the experience of tenants applying for ERA and the impact of ERA on households who received assistance and participated in our study. And then Emily Dowdell, a Managing Director for Policy Solutions at Reinvestment Fund, will offer in uh, additional depth and context into the survey findings through discussion of reflections from landlord and tenant focus groups that her and her team conducted over the past year. And we'll end our webinar today with time for a Q&A, uh, for audience Q&A. 
And to do that, we're gonna ask that you place your questions in the Q&A section of the webinar, which is on the bottom of your screen and labeled Q&A. And we will review those and, and save some time to ask questions at the end. If we can't get to all of them, we'll try to answer them in the chat or in the Q&A box, or we can also follow up after the webinar is concluded. Next slide. So one of the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic was that it threatened to cause millions of people to fall behind on their rent. It threatened their housing stability and placed many at risk of eviction. More than 8 million renters, renter households, and the majority of them low income and disproportionately people of color were behind on their rent by the end of 2020. In response to this crisis, the federal government appropriated an unprecedented $46.5 billion in funding and created the Emergency Rental Assistance Program with the goal to help low-income renters address rental and utility arrears and prevent evictions. With guidance from Treasury, state and local governments designed and scaled up more than 500 uh, programs across the country. And as of December 2022, more than 10.7 million ERA payments had been made to households and landlords across the country. Understanding the housing crisis that so many households face and recognizing the role that safe, stable, and affordable housing plays as a determinant of health, wellness, and economic no mobility, the study that we're talking about today aimed to, one, understand the characteristics of households who applied for emergency rental assistance, to shed light on the experience of tenants who applied for ERA, including their likelihood of receiving assistance once they applied, and three, measure the impact of emergency rental assistance on short-term tenant outcomes, such as housing stability, financial well-being, physical and mental health, as well as several child-related outcomes. Next slide. To do this, our study uh, design utilized both qualitative and quantitative methods. We included 10 sites in the study with an eye towards uh, obtaining geographic diversity, uh, diversity in program size and type of jurisdiction that implemented the program, such as a state program, county program, as well as municipalities. While we strove for diversity in program types so that they would be reflective of ERA programs out there, we want to note that um, the programs that chose to participate may have had you know, greater overall capacity. They may have had greater interest in research and ability to participate in research and they may have had a greater desirability to share data than some of the other programs that existed. Also, due to the varying programs uh, survey size across the sites, as well as our desire not to compare individual programs against each other, the findings that you'll, we're sharing today really reflect pooled outcomes across all sites rather than outcomes from individual sites. So while there were 10 sites, we had uh, five primary study sites who participated. And at these sites, we distributed tenant surveys, collected and uh, analyzed administrative ERA program data, interviewed program administrators, and then conducted landlord and tenant focus groups. So pretty deep dive into these sites. You can see those primary study sites listed on the side and they uh, consist of Allegheny County in Pennsylvania, the city and county of Denver, Colorado, Louisville, Jeff Jefferson County in Kentucky, Northern Ponca Housing Authority, and the state of Oregon. In addition to these five sites, there were five other sites where we worked to just administer the tenant survey only and did not do those other components of the evaluation. Across all 10 sites between October 2022 and February 2023, almost 11,000 survey responses were collected. About a little over 8,000 of those were from respondents who had received ERA funding, and almost 2,500 of those respondents were from people who applied, households that applied, but had not yet received funding by the time they completed the survey. The survey that uh, was administered was designed to capture household characteristics, such as demographic information, household size, and circumstances at application. It looked at the tenant experience of applying for, for assistance, such as the support they received or challenges they may have faced through the application process. And then looked at key indicators of tenant housing and financial stability, tenant physical and mental health, including COVID-19 status or hospitalizations, and then measures of uh, well-being among children in the household. 
all tenants who, who completed the survey were entered into a lottery, and then 25 respondents at each of the sites were selected to receive a, a prepaid $100 debit card for their participation in the survey. So it's our hope that through this method and through this mix of qualitative and quantitative methods, that we'll be able to one, better understand what worked and what challenges remain for retenants um, applying for emergency rental assistance as well as other types of assistance, provide lessons learned for future housing stability programs, particularly as we advocate for permanent emergency rental assistance. And three, we hope it will inspire uh, the exploration of some administrative or other changes that could be made to embed some of the program flexibilities utilized under emergency rental assistance into other housing assistance programs to make these programs more accessible to households that may have multiple barriers to access and may need them the most. So with that uh, overview, it is now my honor uh, to hand the, the presentation and microphone over to Andrew so that Andrew can take us through the experience of ERA program administrators in their journey to implement the program. Thank you, Andrew. All right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about the administration of ERA programs and some of what we learned from administrators, uh, both in terms of the design of their programs, as well as some of the challenges they faced in setting up their programs. As Sarah mentioned, we for this project, we interviewed 13 administrators of five programs. Uh, the interviews predominantly focused on program operations and how and why programs changed over time. And I'll just mention, you know, for this research, we focused on the administration of these five programs. But um, in the course of the pandemic, we interviewed a number of additional administrators for previous work of uh, research. And some of the issues that came up here in this study overlap with what we had learned from our previous research as well regarding the challenges uh, that administrators faced. The decisions that administrators made about the structure and about the design of their programs were typically influenced by um, goals for emergency rental assistance, by Treasury's guidance that changed a few times over the course of the pandemic, by technical constraints uh, that administrators faced, and also by uh, challenges with partnerships as well. And if you can go to the next slide. The five uh, programs that we looked at in this study, along with most other ERA programs, shared very similar goals of housing stabilization and eviction prevention. Uh, and those goals remained consistent throughout the pandemic. And that's not too surprising since those were the primary arguments uh, for the need for emergency, rent, uh, emergency rental assistance in the first place. But some programs also used ERA funds to try to address other housing problems that they saw as significant threats uh, to the housing stability and to public health in their community. Uh, one particular problem was overcrowding. And for example, tribal programs uh, uh, were particularly intent on addressing overcrowding, which they viewed as the primary form of a primary form of housing instability in their communities. The strategies and program designs that programs adopted Though, uh, despite the consistent goals, uh, the way programs were designed varied quite a bit in a number of ways. And so some programs, for example, gave priority to households who are facing imminent risk of eviction by partnering with court systems or by fast-tracking applications of, of eviction-related applications, and others didn't necessarily do that quite as strongly. Some programs required applications to be submitted online uh, with some help if, if, if applicants called a hotline to try to get some help with their application, while others provided various pathways to submitting their applications, such as providing uh, uh, drop boxes and community centers, for example, or social service organizations where people would drop in their, their applications. Uh, in terms of processing applications, some programs used uh, what we identified as a sort of a, an assembly line approach to processing applications where different staff were responsible for different stages of the application process. You know, so one person might be responsible for the intake of the application, another staff member might be responsible for following up on missing documentation and so on. And other programs uh, used what we wound up calling sort of a, a case management approach for lack of a better term, where the same staff person followed the application from initial submission all the way 
to completion, decision making and completion and the decision being made. And I do want to mention that technology was a significant challenge for some programs and how to manage the sheer number of applicants uh, trying to, to apply and also processing all those applications. Some programs chose sort of what uh, off the shelf software to manage their application applications. And one administrator uh, described their situation pretty well, uh, or the situation of other programs as well, pretty well, when they noted that their off the shelf software was better than the spreadsheet that they were initially using to, to, to track applications. But the software in the end was still pretty inflexible and didn't really meet their needs, even after they spent a considerable amount of money on that software. Other programs were able to custom make a system that would help them manage the applications and take them through the, the approval process. But that also takes significant resources and know-how. And I mentioned this issue of technology because as you'll hear later when um, we hear about the tenant and landlord focus groups, We'll hear about you know some of the um, challenges that tenants had and landlords had were finding out where their application was in the approval process after they had applied. And there were some software systems that allowed programs to do that, and there were other systems that did not. Um, and then another interesting difference that I'll note that um, came up during our interviews, and I think probably deserves an area of um, the interesting area of future research for someone would be uh, how partnerships were structured and contracted. And what I mean by that is some programs paid their uh, nonprofit or their partners, most many times community-based partners um, okay. for performance. So they paid, a, they paid you know, a certain amount per application after the fact, or you know, others paid just a fixed amount to these organizations. Some partners uh, or some programs uh, gave some funds up front in advance to their partners, recognizing that some community-based organizations didn't really have the resources to do outreach or to help with the application process for applicants without those upfront funds. Uh, and I and I think that it it would just be interesting to see which which uh, way worked best. And it was in, it's important because most ERA programs and even the ones we interviewed for this study did partner with other organizations to uh, help with certain aspects of their program. And on the next slide, um, I have a box highlighted on a table that, um, oh, there it is, uh, that shows, if you look, it doesn't show up maybe too well on your screens, but it shows how our five programs that we interviewed uh, use their partnerships with other organizations. All of them worked with other organizations for outreach to try to get the message out that these funds were available. Uh, some also used um, uh, partner organizations to help applicants apply for assistance to get them through the application process. Uh, and then others um, partnered with uh, courts and court-based organizations to try to really focus on that eviction prevention. Uh, another thing that really uh, gets highlighted uh, during our interviews and, uh, and well, that gets highlighted when, when you talk to administrators is the shifting design of programs over time. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, so programs didn't just vary across programs, but there was also variation over time of, this, of the same site. And so programs, uh, many programs kept changing their structure for two reasons. Uh, one is it's important to keep in mind that the scale of funds that was appropriated by Congress, uh, a total of $46 billion, and the uh, amount of time, the limited amount of time that programs had to spend that money, particularly the first 25 billion had to be spent by the end of 2022, for the most part, it was unprecedented. And so administrators had for the for the most part, you know, never implemented programs so large in such a short amount of time. And as one administrator sort of aptly put it, is you know, they didn't have the time really to proactively strategize about how they were going to implement the program. They implemented a program and then improved it over time. And so as programs learned what wasn't working, they would alter their design. And then the other thing was occurring at the same time is Treasury 
um, in, on a good note, continually updated the guidance that they were giving to programs about, about how they could use the funds and programs changed their design as this new guidance came out as well. And I just give a little summary on the slide of just some highlights. These weren't all, all the dates on here, but um, really uh, some of the significant changes that we saw or changes that we thought were significant and when they were made in the treasury guidance. And you can see that there were some significant changes um, in January, just the initial guidance came out that did not allow a direct payments to tenants, for example, or did not allow a flexibility such as self-attestation versus uh, documentation of income, for example. And then in February, Treasury and their guidance allowed self-attestation for certain eligibility requirements to try to reduce the barriers to people applying for assistance and to try to to reduce documentation challenges so people could get assistance more quickly. And there were other changes as well. And programs made changes as this new guidance came out. So we saw significant changes over time. Uh, and I'll mention most of those changes were to try to get, try to make it easier for programs to more quickly serve renters who needed the assistance the most. Um, and so programs did change. Uh, and that's just a little sort of overview um, of programming, uh, of the administration of these programs. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca Ye uh, from the Housing Initiative at Penn, who is going to talk about survey findings uh, about outcomes for renters. Thanks, Andrew. As Andrew mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about what we found about the impact of receiving emergency rental assistance on tenants. Next slide, please. Much of what we know about who applied, their likelihood of getting emergency rental assistance, and the impact of emergency rental assistance comes from our survey data. As Sarah mentioned earlier, the survey was conducted across 10 sites between October 2022 and February 2023 and includes nearly 11,000 responses. So, you know, who took our survey? In terms of demographics, a majority of respondents reported that their household includes children. A large majority also identified as women. Nearly half identified as disabled. 46% 46, uh, 46 of respondents identified as white and 43% as black. A vast majority of survey respondents reported that they were behind on rent or worried every day or most days about whether they'd be able to remain in their homes when they applied. And about a fifth of respondents had an active eviction case. Some households had prior experience with housing instability. So for instance, nearly half reported that they had made a late rent payment in the two years prior to the pandemic or some had experienced eviction or spent time in a shelter in the two years leading up to the, to the pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, survey takers also shared information about their experiences with the application process and the status of their housing, finances, and health and well-being, both at the time of the survey as well as at the time when they applied, essentially giving us two points in time for us to understand how households have fared. And to understand impact, we compared respondents that said that they received emergency rental assistance and those that said that they did not. Uh, we conducted chi-square or t-tests as appropriate, and these tests do not show causation, but they help us understand if the differences between these two groups, um, people who received emergency rental assistance and those that didn't, um, to see if the differences between these groups are significant or not, or put another way to see if the difference between the groups is real and not just random. Um, so that's kind of one way we looked at, um, we tried to understand outcomes um, for some analyses. We also compared change over time or use the logistic regression to understand the causal effect of emergency rental assistance as an intervention. In our logistic regressions, we were able to control for 10 characteristics. And I wanna note that we did not examine the how the shifting program structures and design 
that Andrew covered earlier, influenced outcomes. So now that I've covered a little bit on um, you know, how we try to understand the outcomes, let's jump on in. Um, and I want to note at the top here that, um, sorry, go back a slide, um, at the top here that the analyses and values mentioned in this section uh, for the remainder of my section were statistically significant. So we found that tenants that received emergency rental assistance were more housing secure. They were more likely to be living in their own rental units compared to those that did not receive emergency rental assistance. 94% of tenants that had assistance were living in their own homes compared to only 88% of tenants that did not receive assistance. Meanwhile, nearly 12% of nearly 12% of tenants who did not receive emergency rental assistance were experiencing some form of homelessness compared to just 6% of tenants who did receive assistance. So in our definition, homelessness ranged from uh, living with a family member or friend without paying rent or living in a hotel or motel to living in a shelter in a car or outdoors. We also looked at this indicator through a logistic regression analysis, and we found that controlling for tenants' living arrangements at the time of application, as well as controlling for language, age, race, and ethnicity, if a respondent received emergency rental assistance, then their odds of being homeless at the time of the survey decreased by a factor of 0.54. Um, next slide, please. Or in other words, tenants with emergency rental assistance were half as likely to become homeless. Next slide, please. We also looked at other aspects of housing security. So for instance, tenants that received emergency rental assistance were less likely to owe back rent compared to those that did not receive emergency rental assistance. And this aligns with other research that HIP has conducted in Philadelphia, um, even among only the households that owed back rent when they applied for assistance, tenants with, with emergency rental, that received emergency rental assistance were more likely to catch up on their rent than those that did not receive emergency rental assistance. Next slide, please. These tenants were also less worried about their housing situation. Nearly half of tenants without emergency rental assistance worried every day about staying in their homes in the two weeks leading up to the survey compared to just over a third of tenants without emergency rental assistance. Next slide, please. Importantly, emergency rental assistance impacted outcomes beyond housing. Next slide, tenants with assistance were slightly less financially precarious. We found that 26% of tenants that received emergency rental assistance reported that they were just managing on their income compared to 19% of tenants without assistance. They were also less likely to be going into debt. Next slide, children in financially distressed households often sense such stress and in response may exhibit feelings of anger, anxiety, sadness, irritability, et cetera. And we found that children in homes that received emergency rental assistance exhibited fewer signs of such distress. So for instance, a quarter of kids in homes with emergency rental assistance showed signs of sadness compared to nearly a third of kids in homes without emergency rental assistance. Next slide. Receiving emergency rental assistance also had impacts on healthcare access and health outcomes. Tenants with that received emergency rental assistance were more likely to have access to healthcare. 77% of tenants with healthcare that received emergency rental assistance felt that their needs were being met compared with only 68% of tenants with healthcare that did not receive emergency rental assistance. Next slide. Um, they also had better health outcomes, controlling for language, age, race, and ethnicity. If a respondent received 
emergency rental assistance, their odds of reporting their health as being the same or better compared to a year ago increased by a factor of 1.4, or in other, in other words, tenant that received assistance um, were more likely to report that their health was the same or better uh, compared to those that did not receive assistance. These tenants also had better mental health outcomes and were less likely to report that someone in their household experienced long COVID. So all in all, emergency receiving emergency rental assistance helped to stabilize those households during the COVID-19 public health pandemic and economic crisis, and not just in housing situations, but it also helped in terms of finances and health and well-being. Um, but importantly, not all groups of tenants were equally likely to receive emergency rental assistance. And I'll pass it over to Cypress Mars, Senior Research Analyst at Housing Initiative at Penn, to talk about that in greater detail. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cypress Mars. Before I jump in, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the National Low Income Housing Coalition and the Reinvestment Fund for what has been a fruitful research partnership. And again, and to reiterate uh, what Sarah said at the top and thank all the program administrators, tenants and landlords who spent time sharing their experiences with us throughout the course of this project. Finally, I'd like to thank all the folks that are frequently overlooked who work behind the scenes at Penn and across partner organizations and in government to make this public facing work possible. The findings we are sharing today uh, truly represent the time and energy of so many people. Um, so let me get into it. So far today, what we've, we've talked about, what we learned doing the study about how programs were administered and the impact of receiving assistance on household level outcomes. What I'm going to do is a little bit different. That is, I'm going to talk through some of the work we did to try to understand how well targeted ERA funds were and how tenants moved through the application process. We took a number of approaches to try to answer these questions, and I'll walk through some of this work today. Next slide, please. Um, so as Sarah mentioned at the top, we had application data from a, from a number of partner sites. And this data um, allowed us to sort of like explore the geographic trends and who applied for assistance. And then on the basis of this to develop a sense of how well targeted um, these partner programs are. So to do this, we compared um, how zip codes were ranked by the Urban Institute's Rental Assistance Priority Index, which was developed as a tool for understanding which areas um, were high need or high priority on the basis of housing and stability risk, co the impact of COVID-19 in that area, and measures of equity, um, with the number of applications relative to renters that applied in each zip code. And so what this analysis allowed us to do was develop a sense of how well targeted the program was. And what we found was really what we would expect to find, which is that a higher proportion of renter households applied from high priority areas in comparison to renters in lower priority areas. Um, this suggests that the program was fairly well targeted to need across the sites for which we had data. This is really an instance where what we found wasn't that interesting, and that's probably a good thing. Next slide, please. Um, so that gives us a sense of like where applications came from geographically and likely reflects the outreach that was done by and in partnership with ERA programs. In our survey, we asked applicants how they learned about emergency rental assistance, and the most common ways were online, through family and friends, and from community organizations. Um, it was also very interesting to find that landlords really emerged as a key source of information about the program for many survey respondents. Next slide, please. Um, as, as Rebecca alluded to, um, we were also really interested in understanding who successfully received funding through the program once they submitted an application. And so for the, the first way we sort of tried to investigate with this was by looking at funding rates for various subgroups. So overall, the funding rate for survey respondents was 77.2%. Um, Really noteworthy, individuals who reported experiencing homelessness at the time of submitting an application were only funded about 52% of the time. Um, this may have been due to the fact that some programs prioritized applicants who had active eviction cases, although other recent work out of the Yale School for Public Health has indicated that people experiencing homelessness tend to have 
difficult to need navigating the process of applying for housing support programs and po points towards an area where innovative new approaches to implementation and outreach are likely necessary to successfully um, reach this particularly vulnerable population. Um, we also found that approval rates were actually higher for some subgroups, including people with disabilities, people for whom English is a second language, and Black respondents. But as we dug in to try to really understand what was going on there, we found that funding rates um, varied across individual programs. A great example of this is that applicants to the Northern Ponca Tribal Program were approved about 93% of the pro time, which is really reflective of how, of how their program ran more generally, while well, Native Americans who submitted applications to other programs um, were approved at lower than average rates. Um, likewise, the, these numbers sort of like conceal variations that existed between programs where where a group where a group um, was less likely to get funded in that area, even if the the average we're seeing here. Uh, looks close, right? Um, and so this sort of pointed towards like a cross program variation and approval, like this sort of cross program variation and approval rates for these subgroups suggested that these differentials were appearing as the result of like various um, sort of like sticking points uh, or choke points in implementation that were made at the program level. Um, slide um, so as Andrew sort of alluded to, right, like programs changed a lot over the course. So we really tried to ask, in, um, so like the way we did this analysis was by like asking applicants about their experience. Um, and so to try, right, to try to understand this in more detail and hopefully derive lessons that can help inform implementation of future housing stability challenges programs, we looked at the specific challenges that survey respondents reported during the application process and the rates at which the, these respondents um, got funding. Um, and again, this is a way to try to like identify particular choke points um, at which it became like more difficult or less likely for applicants to, to receive funding, even if they were like successfully reached out to um, and, and entered our survey sample. Right. And so what the table uh, here shows is that about 50 percent of people who took our survey didn't face any challenges while applying for assistance. And that among that group, 88 percent of them um, reported receiving funding. But conversely, applicants who did report um, facing challenges during the application process were funded at lower rates across the board. This um, table sort of walks through how, how many people faced each of their, these issues individually and what the the funding rate for the subgroup was um and i'm just going to sort of read th read through them because it's going to come up again in the, the next slide right so these challenges included not knowing who to call for for help having difficulty engaging their landlord in the application process having trouble finding the application or finding the application too confusing or long not having internet access or having help um, or needing help related to a disability that they didn't, that they weren't able to get, and that there were lower funding rates associated with each of these challenges individually. But we also looked at what happened when survey respondents reported having multiple challenges facing an app. Um, multiple challenges in submitting their application. So on the left hand here, what we see is a comparison bar chart um, illustrating again, right, that the fact that uh, applicants who, who reported no challenges were, were funded 88% of the time, while as applicants faced like progressively more challenges, they were funded, um, the, the likelihood of them being funded decreased so that applicants who reported having faced five or more challenges um, of those challenges listed on the previous slide were only funded 55% of the time. Um, that's a 33% difference in approval rates, which I, I think is pretty striking. Likewise, on the right-hand side, we see that as survey respondents reported facing more challenges with the process of applying, they tended to report longer wait times, right? And so in emergency situations where the goal is to distribute funds both widely and quickly, it is important for programs to be designed and implemented in ways that reduce the amount of friction experienced by applicants as they apply. Next slide, please. Um, so sort of 
right from that, we, we also had found that evidence that survey respondents who are approved for or received funding were more likely to have received help during the application process relative to applicants um, like survey respondents whose applications were pending or denied. Um, in particular, applicants who received help understanding the application process and like actually completing the application received funding at at significantly higher rates than those who did not. Um, while applicants who reported having received help with landlord education and sort of like ne negotiating with their landlord, um, we, we found that that had a had a smaller impact on approval rates. Um, so we. I'm going to pass it off to Emily Dowdle, who will share um, some findings that will add additional nuance to these questions around how both tenants and landlords experience the program. Thanks, everyone. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Emily Dowdle from Reinvestment Fund, and I'm going to talk about um, the focus groups we collect. Uh, we conducted where we collected some really um, powerful and detailed articulations from tenants and from landlords who participated um, or tried to participate in emergency rental assistance. Next slide, please. Um, so we conducted 10 focus groups, one tenant and one landlord group in each of the five primary um, locations. Um, so we spoke with um, a total of 39 tenants and 34 landlords. It does look like there are some um, people with experience with the program um, on this webinar right now, which is great. Um, next slide. So... Um, we heard from a really wide range of views because we also included people who had both received rental assistance and those who were not successful in receiving it. Same with landlords who had tenants who applied who were successful and not successful across all those programs. We really heard a variety of feedback, uh, but there were a couple of really strong common themes we heard across all the groups. Um, and that was one was that ERA did provide critical assistance at a critical at a key time when tenants were struggling to pay rent and landlords were struggling to collect it, um, and they were concerned about covering their expenses like mortgage payments and other operating costs. But we also heard again and again the same top complaint, and that was a lack of satisfactory communication from the program, um, and that was at the application stage as well as after applications were submitted, whether and when payment might get received. Next slide. So um, we heard um, from the tenants that there were a variety of experiences um, based on which program they were in. So some programs were easier than others. That ease also varied with when they applied because as Andrew um, went over, the uh, there were a lot of changes in programs over time. Um, but the ability to connect with a, an ERA administrator to help walk an applicant through the process and answer questions as they arose was a really critical difference between whether a tenant reported a positive or negative experience. Um, we heard that spending months not knowing if they would receive um, emergency rental assistance was very stressful um, at an already stressful time when there were other um, issues going on. Overall, tenants uh, reported that landlords were helpful in um, completing the applications, not universal across the board, but more than not. Um, and most of the focus group participants said that their relationship with their landlord or property manager didn't change from before to after the application. Um, and many said their landlords uh, were not really concerned about where the payment came from, whether it was from the emergency rental assistance program, just that they would get paid. Um, so some of these uh, quotes that we heard from uh, tenants were, you know, the process and with Northern Ponca was really easy. Um, just a few simple questions. Even my elderly mother could do it. Um, another person reporting that there was a big challenge going back and forth between the ERA rep and then the leasing office, not knowing what information they had to collect. Information was mixed up. Um, spending a lot of time on the phone trying to go back and forth and sort of the tenant being responsible for um, mediating between uh, the landlord and the program, um, and then getting uh, incorrect or inconsistent information about the time frame. Um, people getting uh, lots of technology issues came up, getting emails that would ask a tenant to do something on the application, and when they did it, um, it would just keep showing that that had not yet been done. 
So a lot of frustration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but we also heard a lot about the positive impacts on tenants um, as a result of receiving rental assistance. For many, uh, they described a psychological burden of worry being lifted. Um, and some of that you saw reflect in the survey results as well. Um, you know, people were worried about making rent and this really helped their mental health. Um, there were, the focus group participants reported um, several critical ways that uh, the assistance helped with their overall finances. Um, and that included allowing them to provide for their families generally, buying household necessities, paying off debts, uh, becoming more budget conscious, and helping to take care of loved ones who are struggling. So I think, again, this speaks to the idea that the, um, the impact is beyond just the recipient themselves, but actually can trickle out, um, spread out through uh, communities as families are taking care of each other and their extended families. Um, and so some of these really powerful reflections we heard were that, you know, I felt relief, no more nausea. I felt physically different. I could even see a future. Um, and then at the time I received rental assistance, I was working almost full time. I was in school as well. And even though I was working, I just couldn't catch up. So getting the assistance felt like I was able to breathe. And then we heard from someone whose kids have special medical needs. Um, and they said that um, because of having those funds, they were able to get the types of um, equipment they needed, the home humidifier, air purifiers, um, to make a better home environment and then not have to go to the doctor so often. Next slide, please. Um, on the landlord side, um, we did hear probably more discontent. Um, again, we heard a lot about um, the difficulty of the application process, uh, a lot of confusion and frustration, no way of verifying what step you were in. They would call and leave a message and wouldn't get a phone call back for months. You know, I think. Um, as Andrew conveyed, a lot of the administrators were aware of some of these problems um, and, um, and tried to fix them throughout um, with varying results. Um, landlords are really concerned about the paperwork burden and particularly landlords with multiple units who said there was no benefit from scale. Um, so if they owned a lot, they still had to fill out the exact same amount of paperwork for every single unit instead of saying, I have this building with 20 units, let me apply it once for all my tenants. Um, they said their tenants struggle with technology, especially their seniors, um, seniors living in their properties, um, and landlords sometimes did take the time to help their tenants apply. Um, sometimes there was difficulty matching the funds to the tenants. They would receive money, but with no idea which tenant it was meant to go to, um, or it would um, arrive for a tenant who had already left. Um, so there was a lot of confusion about linking the payment to the tenants. Um, some processes did get easier over time, but landlords had difficulty keeping up with all those changes that, uh, that Andrew outlined, such as the changes to ERA rules, changes to the application itself, Differences for different ERA programs, you know, from the Northern Ponca folks, we heard that process was different than the state programs they might have experienced in their state. Um, and there was conflicting information from different staff people at the programs people spoke with. Next slide. Um, landlords were split on F emergency rental assistance, reduced turnover. Many believed the moratorium was actually a bigger factor um, or reported that it was. Um, for some, ERA changed their relationships with their tenants for the better. They said the tenants realized that they, the landlords, wanted to help. Um, and in some cases, it opened the landlord's eyes to the tenants, uh, the hardships that their tenants were experiencing. For others, um, the ERA, ERA actually strained their relationships or caused a loss of trust. And that was not always due to the fault of the tenant. But the long wait times and the lack of transparency actually raised tensions and made landlords, some landlords, feel like they were getting the worst end of the deal. Um, a lot of landlords reported they were concerned about abuse of the program, wondering if people who should have gotten uh, money did not and people who did maybe shouldn't have um, concern about finances in general and financial management by their tenants. Um, but again, this theme of the lack of transparency and communication and predictability, these came up again as reasons why a landlord might not want to participate in the future. Um, 
But overall, most landlords could point to at least one of their tenants who needed and got help from the program. Um, and one uh, representative landlord said, I'm very happy, appreciative that the program was out there in spite of the challenges. Next slide. And so very quickly, I'll go through some of the suggestions. Um, you know, people didn't just have complaints about the program. They actually had suggestions for how a next, uh, a future iteration could be improved. Um, so both tenants and landlords started with a simplified process with less paperwork. Tenants also asked for readily available um, FAQs with answers to common questions. Um, the ability to link their out rental applications to other social service databases via a social security number or other identifier so that they wouldn't have to fill out all of the information they also fill out for other types of assistance. Um, and more help for people with disabilities who are not comfortable or skilled using computers. Um, you know, this came up a little bit in Cypress's reports on, on people who sought help who um, needed extra assistance and didn't get it. There were some people with visual um, impairments who had difficulty applying. On the landlord side, um, they asked for more landlord input. Um, unsurprisingly, they asked for the ability to apply for multiple units at once, ways to check the status of the application, clear and consistent program information, more fully staffed programs, support for tenants from caseworkers um, and options for in-person applications for people who are not great with technology, um, the ability to apply themselves when tenants were not proactive, shorter wait times and more monitoring of program abuse. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah to get into some questions and answers, but thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks, um, Emily. Thank you, Rebecca, Cypress, and Andrew. And you guys can all turn your cameras on. I'll look at me back. Thanks for the presentation. So we have some questions in the Q&A. And I'll just remind folks, we have a few minutes. So if you have a question for the Q&A, please feel free to, to pop it in there. Um, so the first question that came up was, um, in terms of program outreach, uh, did the research team have any insights about effective channels or methods for reaching eligible individuals and households. Any uh, thoughts on the effective outreach measures that, that came up? Um, and I'll post this to anybody who wants like, to, to answer it. So I'll just mention too, and this is not just from this study though, I'll say this is from uh, various studies that the coalition has done uh, of ours, as well as in partnership with the housing initiative at Penn. But uh, two thoughts that initially init that immediately come to mind are um, partnering with community-based organizations that may be more knowledgeable about their own communities um, and reaching out to their own communities than the larger program, like say, whether it's a state program or a city program. Um, and multiple ways for people to apply, not solely relying on online um, applications. Thanks. Anyone? Okay. Um, when someone asked um, in the chat earlier, sort of like, were these results you would have expected given ERA, or were you surprised? Um, at the results? Um, and if so, what were some of the most surprising results that you would see? My, one of the uh, viewers had mentioned that they were surprised by the, the slide uh, earlier in Rebecca's presentation around um, folks with ERA were more um, housing secure, but were there results that you thought were surprising um, in the study? I mean, oh, okay. go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I think that uh, more housing secure is definitely a relative term. Um, I, I think like in the context of the whole presentation, I would definitely not say that people are housing stable as a result, but it did help them uh, get through the economic crisis. Um, and they had bet slight, like better outcomes than people who did not receive emergency rental assistance. So I think I just want to make that clarification around uh, being more more housing secure and that. 
And in terms of um, what surprised me, I, I think that what we were looking at here um, were, I think that the question, the person who asked the question um, was like, oh, it seems like a logical, uh, some, some of the things that we ex examined are very logical. And I, I think that we did need to test that because we don't actually, this is the first time such a program has at such a large scale been implement, implemented. And it was important for us to look at some of these things, like did it actually um, help at all in terms of back rent? Um, and we see that it helps a little bit. Um, and and um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and, and see if anybody else has anything else to add. Yeah, I mean, thanks Rebecca for that. And I'll just add, I think while many of it the housing stability part is one of these, I think what is was nice about this study too, is it looks beyond a little bit of housing stability and some of the other aspects of households' uh, lives and sort of sort of more holistically, which is uh, something that was really important during this study to start to dive into. And we hope to be able to do kind of more of that to really look at the relationship between uh, programs like this and sort of holistically what's what's happening. But others have thoughts. Yeah, I'd like to just jump in and say that something that really surprised me was the extent to which we found people reporting internet access being a barrier, given that our our survey was it was itself administered online, right? Mm -hmm. And so, right, like yeah. that that's almost certainly like severely un undercounting the the folks for whom that was a problem. And yeah, so I just wanted to say to say that. Great, thanks, Cypress. I think the other thing just to highlight too is the the um, impact of the housing stability services and supports, sort of the the level of support, the impact of that, and how that was really important um, was nice. What came up out of the survey um, and was important. Um, great. I think one of the questions that I'll just sort of came up in the chat as well was sort of how do we interpret these findings? Um, it came up as a question, and you know, is the report saying that folks who received it uh, were more sort of um, that ERA received the ERA received by applicants produced these outcomes, or is it saying that those who received it were more stable when the assistant reached them? And sort of like, how should folks think about? And I sort of broaden the question: like, so how should we think about these outcomes um, given the, the the study? I know it's a broad question, but would just love your thoughts on sort of how do we interpret these findings? I think this this is a really great question, and it's very. I think that there are several different ways to think about it. So. In terms of my section, there are pieces where we look at causal effect, but that is limited. Um, a good uh, part of the findings that I was presenting were based off of um, associate association. Um, I think that the other thing I'll mention is that a lot of this research aligns with other research that HIP has been conducting. So um, some of our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania have looked at this um, in Philadelphia um, in California, and there are some things that align there. And then the last thing I want to see is if Cyprus would, wants to chime in a little bit around the barriers, because I think that this really links up to uh, to your your section that you were talking about. Yeah, no, I I think I think it's a really a really great question, right? How how you make programs accessible to the people who are who are the most vulnerable. Um I I definitely see the sort of findings around the fact that the the people who maybe had had the most trouble were were also and l less likely to get funding um were probably right like less stable sort of going in as as a reason to take as a reason to take the results with with somewhat of a, a a grain of salt um or not even a grain of salt but just that 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 the picture is the picture is maybe more complicated in in some aspects um yeah but that said i i do think that there's like sort of like an essential problem around um how you 
right? Like ERA was amazing because it was a a a, a chance to administer programs that were were where there weren't scarce resources or or resources were much less scarce. Um, yeah, no, I think I think it's an open question and something I'm I'm thinking a lot about in 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 other research I'm doing. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I clearly we could have spend more time talking about this, but we we had an hour um, for our webinar today, um, and clearly there's other research questions that we hope to dive into, and hopefully there'll be future research coming. Um, so I want to thank you, Emily and Cypress and Rebecca and Andrew for your work and for joining us here today. I want to thank all of our guests who were joining us on our webinar, um, initial webinar on this, and we will uh, please. Uh, we'll get the report out to you all. I know there was trouble accessing the report in the um, in the chat. Uh, I think it, part of it might have been a Chrome issue. So clear your cache and see if that helps or use another browser. We will email the report out to folks who registered so that you will have it directly and we'll get that uh, fixed up on our website as well. Um, and feel free to reach out with any questions um, and more information and there'll be more to come. So thank you everybody and have a great uh, afternoon. <laughs>